from station to station back to Dusseldorf City, we meet Iggy Pop and David Bowie. In a previous Bristol video, I talked about Chris Pettit, Radio On, the film, and how it tries to capture a Eurocentric aesthetic in that time of art school, sulfate, grey coats, serious young men from the north. I'm back in Bristol again today and um, I'm going to talk a bit more about the modern and where it is, where it's gone, what happened to it. When did it begin? What does modern mean? Strictly speaking, modern means just now. So postmodern means after just now. We use modern, but it's no longer valid. We still use modern, but we're wrong because modern is gone. Modern was a period in history, a period in a story and a narrative. Because in the West, we shape history with narrative. Modern now no longer means just now. It means a specific period. When did that period begin? And when did it end? One argument is that modern began with Cubism, or maybe round about 1905, as art became definitively modern and less representational. I would say there were precedents before that, the work of the symbolists and the decadence in literature in the late 19th century. So let's say the modern begins with modern art, round about the turn of the 20th century. It then lasts throughout that period of accelerated communications, the birth of the mass media, printing presses, the dissemination of photography through film, video, television, all those things. And of course the increasing speed. There's a sense in which we are rich culturally, richer than anybody has ever been before. Because in our lifetimes it is possible to the due to us living through the age of mechanical reproduction, as Walt Benjamin wrote, that we see more art, culture, history, representation of those things, copies of those things, than anybody ever did in human history. Even the richest monarchs, the most profligate despots alive, the richest, the wealthiest, would never see as much as we would. So within our first few years of life, within our first few decades, we see so much. We've been programmed to always seek the new for the lives we have lived and the time we have lived in. Fashion, vogue, capitalism. We have to be with it. We have to keep up to date. We have to stay with the endless royal choke and forward movement of the new. Yet at the same time, could we realistically have hoped that this would last forever? As we reached the 1980s and postmodernism began to take over, when pastiche, parody, cutting, pasting, the free use of surfaces and symbols mixed together in unusual ways began to come forward when the classical and the romantic started to fade. We entered a new phase, the postmodern, late capitalism, capitalist realism as Mark Fisher said. And it's from then on we cease to find that nothing is new, nothing is protean, nothing is truly original or at least that's my experience. And it was certainly the experience of Fisher and Simon Reynolds, author of Retromania. Yet they maintained an interest in some of the new forms of dance music that emerged in the late 80s and into the 90s. But by the end of the century, we were feeling that even this was over, even this was done. For me, it was over long before that. But that's my temperament. I'm Western white male. I cleave to romanticism and to the modern. 
I saw certain romanticism in the modern. I don't expand upon that here because that's for another time. But now, in the endlessly contemporary, where all we have is the free play of past images and surfaces, of cut and paste and pastiche, collage, is anything truly new and original? There's a fine mizzle in Bristol today. Not exactly rain, not exactly mist, not exactly drizzle. Negotiating the outskirts of the city centre with its multiple roads, flyovers, underpasses is rather like the scene in Solaris, the Tarkovsky version, where there's that six minute drive to the ultimate city, which seems to go on twice as long and last eternally, and gives the impression of a technopole, a vast city stretching across continents across vast distances. I speak about narrative as part of history because of course in the West, as I say, we build narratives. The Enlightenment was a new chapter, a real step forward. And from the Enlightenment through to the modern, we always had a sense of progress. This was our narrative, our grand narrative, as historians and philosophers call it. That narrative is now arguably disrupted by the other by the non-white world, by the non-secular world, by a world which never had an enlightenment, by a world which does not accept the grand narrative. Strangely, that world is a world largely built by white male philosophers, the world of postmodernism. Lyotard wrote that postmodernism is a distress towards meta-narratives. So postmodernism is distress towards grand narratives. The idea that they're not valid, or that they are not valid to all. The edifices of the culture which we take for granted and of postmodernism are in doubt. The centre no longer holds. So what is all this stuff about modernism, postmodernism, grand narrative? What does it all mean? What, what, why am I talking about it? Obviously it's applicable to all sorts of things, but it's something that's always on my mind anyway. Um, and, you know, I think one of the interesting things about hauntology, which intersects with these things, is that the key thing I get out of hauntology is this idea about nostalgia for a future that we never had and in the writings of Mark Fisher and Simon Reynolds they talk about their dissatisfaction as time goes on beyond the mid 80s with a lack of anything new. Now Simon Reynolds is about a year younger than me and Mark Fisher is about seven years younger than me and Mark Fisher sadly took his own life um, in 2017 10 years after his breakthrough masterpiece Capitalist Realism which is an amazing book and I've been reading his other writings and I'm behind the curve but sometimes being behind the curve is good because it gives you critical distance but I've just reread his collection Ghosts of My Life which is subtitled Writings on Depression, Hauntology and Lost Futures and it's those lost futures is what we're nostalgic for, nostalgic for. And what interests me the most is that both Reynolds and Fisher, when they write and talk about music, they discuss the lack of the new. And I started to find this from about 1983 to 87, 
where we started to get what people now call landfill indie. The Smiths were happening. I found that there was very little new that was happening. People were stuck in a guitar band thing. And you know, the Smiths had their moments, so they prefer Morrissey's solo stuff. Um, Japan broke up and Sylvian started doing things which incorporated the sort of feel of ECM jazz, which I discovered in a big way, you know, some 10 years after that. And it seemed to me that what Sylvian was doing was setting out the future of rock music as it merged with sort of ambient and European jazz into sort of a broader thing because rock music seems to have lost its touch with the real, with the acoustic instruments. Um, the timbres all seem mediated through digital synths and what have you, which were predictable and, you know, only Eno and Barbieri were the people who really managed to get the sort of sounds of the digital synths that weren't just programmable presets. So, for me, that was the time. Reynolds seemed to say the same thing, but both he and Fisher seemed to cleave to some of the dance music of the late 70s and early 80s, and you know, it wasn't entirely... I wasn't entirely untouched by this myself, but I found that the dance music that I liked tended to be stuff which was made by former rock musicians. System 7, Steve Hillage and Maquette Giraudi, um, and people like The Shaman, who'd been a rock band, sort of a few things like that. There weren't many other examples. I think I've got about seven dance albums. And of course, it wasn't a form which lent itself to albums. So in Ghosts of My Life, Fisher writes about how Ghosts, the hit single that Japan had, which went to number five, I believe, and which was very critically lauded after years of them being generally slagged as mere Roxy or Bowie copyists by lots of critics. Because the funny thing was, of course, and it still is in rock culture, that it's okay to ape certain iconic artists. It's okay to sound like the Beatles or the Stones. But if you sounded like Bowie's Low or Roxy Music, then you were merely a copyist. That, to me, highlights the individuality of those records. That they were much more than an adaptation of a tradition. They were something new. And yet, at the same time, they were something old. Something you romantic, as I say. So there seemed to be a certain amount of jealousy, perhaps, of the sort of way that Japan um, and similar bands, Magazine, The Stranglers, the original John Fox Ultravox, cleaved to something different than the traditional. So Fisher and Reynolds, in decrying the postmodern, the lack of anything new, were, in their interest in music that involved other people's timbres, samples. It's not like, samples are not like copying a riff or what have you. They're actual recordings. They use the timbres and tone colours and phrases that other people composed and created. You know, okay, it's theft. So I don't really care about that as long as the artists are credited. But it's in its very nature inauthentic. It's borrowing. It's lazy. It's not the same as somebody who creates a sound using an analogue synth or a guitar or what have you. It's a whole different ball game. It's, it's just requoting. And in Ghosts of My Life, Fisher writes about ghosts, as I say, and he writes about it being the perfect moment and how it was the one time where Japan seemed to sort of summon their emotions. And, you know, this is patent nonsense. Had he never heard Night Porter? Had he never heard All of Quiet Life? Had he never heard The Tenant? You know, these weren't just frozen moments of perfection, which were all but image. They were deeply emotive. They were emotional songs. And that's why Japan resonated so much with a small number of people before the rest of the world caught up with them. Before lightweight pop groups started employing digital synths and came up with the kind of new romantic thing, sort of makeup, um, dyed hair, the sheeny surfaces, but Japan, of course, predated all this, as did Fox's Ultravox. Were they a lot the last glam band or were they the first new romantic band? To me, they were part of a tradition, a tradition I've already talked about that I call the U Romantic. Now, for Fisher to say this is disingenuous, and he mentions how a sample from Ghosts comes up. Well, if these later artists are as authentic and original, as Fisher seems to say, 
then why are they sampling? Can they not come up with something entirely all their own? Something entirely original? Clearly not. And this is the problem with postmodernism. This free play of surfaces, this borrowing, this recontextualizing, it's all very interesting theoretically, and of course it can be interesting in itself, but it doesn't have that protean quality of creation. You're not on solid ground if you listen to music, which recontextualizes, borrows, steals, rather than creates in itself, because that's postmodern music. That's not modern music. Modern music cleaves to grand narrative. It has the weight of history. If we're saying that history and narrative has no meaning, and that it's just a construct of the white man and the other is not included, I find this deeply inauthentic. Can we not accept a tradition which isn't a tradition of the other? What is wrong with the tradition of ourselves? There's a moment where Fisher talks about joy division. Um, there's a whole essay, and Fisher of course sadly suffered from depression, which of course Ian Curtis did, Ian Curtis did of course because of his ep epilepsy, and Fisher sadly took his own life five years ago. And you know, it's not a light thing. These are the young men, the weight of the world on their shoulders to misquote the lyric. But the real point is this. There's one moment in the book where Fisher says about a future that would neither be white or male. And, you know, he cleaves to Joy Division. Joy Division were resolutely white. They were resolutely male, as he points out. And he clearly idolised them. Now, I like Joy Division, but did people take them too seriously compared to lots of other bands? I would say yes, they did. They had a kind of fundamental linearity and simplicity about the sound which was great, but he wasn't massively inventive. They played what they could, like lots of other punk and post-punk bands. They were influenced by groups like the Stranglers. Look at Hook's bass lines, he said it. You know, they were influenced by the Velvet Underground, the Doors, a lot of my favorite bands. And that's absolutely fine and they were great, but they are lauded. The same terms which are used to praise Joy Division the sound of the mausoleum, the word obsidian, are the same gothic cliches that be used, for example, to decry the theatre of the Sisters of Mercy. Is there really that much difference? In the comment about a future that was no longer white or male, which seems to summon up the other, I think it was white, male and heterosexual, sort of saying that there's a kind of moral superiority to the freedom of the female, the non-gender specific and the non-white other, all of which have their place, which I'm not decrying, I'm not denying. Fish is kind of denying his own identity. His identity was of a white male who understood and really cleaved the grand narrative, despite the disynchronicity between what he said about postmodern music and modernism and the search for something new. So what is my argument ultimately? Well, it's not an argument, but maybe it's a realization. In these days where we are nostalgic for futures which never came, where we listen to records on the ghost box label because they remind us of the synth jingles, supposedly, of the BBC Radio Vonic Workshop, public information films, that old Ridgeway film that we used to love. Well, I'm not so sure. I think perhaps we have come to a realization that the modern was a moment, and it was a moment that couldn't last. It lasted from the end of the 19th century until about 1987. Could we really expect things to keep on accelerating, to keep changing, to keep giving us something fresh? And of course there's the culture industry. As advertising, mass production, mass media grew up, capitalism soon discovered that to sell things like the media itself, newspapers, television, advertising, sensation, gossip, these were all things that people wanted. We wanted to be endlessly stimulated because as things sped up, we found that we didn't spend time on them. 
We didn't place them in history in the same way. We just wanted whatever was new. And this is the true malaise of capitalist realism. There is no future now. There is only the eternal present, the eternal contemporary, because we seem to think that modernism would go on and on and that they would always be the new. Now we tell ourselves that things are new when actually they're not new anymore. Maybe history isn't over. Maybe this is just a, a blip, a pause in, in modernism. Socialism is still a new idea. Communism is still a new idea. Capitalism is a far older idea because money itself is far older. Recently, Thomas Piketty, author of Capital, which was a bestseller a few years ago, and clearly references Marx, that spectre of hauntology, has written a new book which is called Socialism Now or Time for Socialism, what have you. And you know, it's interesting how a lot of the neocons have come around to this idea, you know, Fukuyama has become more keen on the idea that we need some intervention to stop the market from destroying everything. So maybe we need to return to grand narrative. Maybe we have to accept that for now things have ceased, but they will come back if we give them time, if we cleave to history. If we allow the narrative that's built up since the Enlightenment to be taken apart by postmodernism so that subjectivity, truth as opposed to fact, objectivity, you know, <laughs> becomes a thing, we're in trouble. Because what's ahead of us is the collapse of the environment. As the environment collapses, capitalism will have to collapse or it will be forced to collapse by large scale rioting, what have you, violence. And the rich will no longer be able to hold on to everything forever. And the resources will dry up. And we'll enter a new stage of history. The post-industrial stage, who can say? And this is where the catastrophe novel comes in, I guess. The real point is this, is that history isn't over because the biggest is yet to come and how we cope with that as we move into an area which will take us beyond capitalism. Socialism will seem inevitable to me. As Marx said, it's going to be part of the turn of history. It's just not going to turn out the way Marx thought. Overpopulation, consumerism, manufacturing and technology will denude and are denuding the earth. Will poison and is poisoning the earth. But I'm convinced that mankind will survive. It might be a very grim situation that we find ourselves in. None of us will be there. So maybe younger viewers will see some of it. People of my age, we won't see it. Or perhaps we'll be unlucky and see just the beginning of it. Just as we enter the point where we're infirm and able to look after ourselves. So where do we go from here? <laughs> it's a good question. This is Outlaw Bookseller, signing out for now. I just wanted to talk a little bit more about some of the things I said in that video with specific reference to two things, a little bit more about Mark Fisher and more specific stuff about Japan. There's Tin Drum from of course, which the um, single Ghosts was um, lifted and became their biggest hit. So I've, I'm doing this because I'm aware that I've posted this on at least one um, Facebook page which relates to Japan and their members and what have you. And I just wanted to put a bit more material in about, about ghosts itself. And so first of all, just to talk briefly about hauntology, I'll talk about haunt hauntology a bit more in relation to um, ghosts, the song um, in another video, but um, just briefly, cause I don't cover it much in that video. If you're not aware of what it is, um, a big part of hauntology is this idea that we are nostalgic for modernist futures, which never came, that this sort of thing stopped moving forward that culture slowed right down and things weren't as modern and they stopped being modern, they started being postmodern. And Mark Fisher makes the point in his writings and in um, various things you can find on YouTube that basically um, technology speeded up, culture seemed to speed up, but music slowed down. And if you listen to almost anything um, after a certain date, he sort of pinned it down from sort of like the early 2000s, maybe a bit later. And if you if you took something from say 2015 and 
put it back into the charts in um, 1995, 20 years earlier, it wouldn't seem that out of place. And he talked about the Arch Arctic Monkeys, um, you know, she looks good on the dance floor as being just the same as something from 1980 and what have you. So he talked about the failure of sort of forward innovation in music. He talks about um, Valerie um, by Amy Winehouse and how when he first heard it, he thought it was a 60s record and so on. So there's that sort of thing. And yet, as you see, there was a dis, dis sort of unity between what he was saying about listening to music which had samples and he writes a lot in this book um a lot about, about music which i haven't listened to which but which clearly uses samples and what have you and as i say in the main part of the video i put forward my thesis that if you use samples if you use other people's work directly if in your own that's inherently postmodern because you're just borrowing it you're showing a distrust of narrative and that movement modern thing where you, where you should innovate and do something new and that my feeling that you know it's kind of inauthentic that if you really do something new you don't have to borrow other people's work you come up with something of your own you don't sample you create a tone color of your own um, I also make the point about tradition and what was wrong with working within a tradition as well. I'll talk more about that another time. But I just wanted to read some specific points from this. And I, you know, to, don't get me wrong, I like Mark Fisher's writing a lot. It's really been sort of obsessing the last few weeks. And I've read Capitalist Realism twice in the last few weeks. And he talks about um, music culture um, in this. And I'm just going to read some sections here. And he says, the distranging of music culture in the 21st century, the ghastly return of industry moguls and boys next door to mainstream pop, the premium put on reality, as in reality TV, um, in popular entertainment, the increased tendency of those in music culture to dress and look like digitally, digitally and surgically enhanced versions of regular folk, the emphasis placed on gymnastic emoting in singing has played a major role in conditioning us to accept consumer capitalism's model of ordinariness. Now, the emphasis placed on gymnastic emoting in singing, say Adele, um, say supposed to rumour. The thing is, he's talking about melismas when people like Mariah Carey, Carey warble from note to note. That's a melisma. And that's something which marks soul music and black forms of music particularly so you know everybody does it because singing is common to, to the human race but that's sort of a fundamentally sort of um stylistic thing which comes from soul music which fundamentally is black music now there's nothing wrong with that in itself but to then speak about a future that wasn't going to be um male white heterosexual and how you know the the sort of um the left wing sort of wanted that it's a bit disingenuous because then of course he talks about joy division can you imagine ian curtis doing a melisma no you can't so that's just the point so okay we live in an age of identity politics where people um you know are asserting their identities and, and you know claiming you know they want to be noticed and recognized and treated like human beings and that's absolutely fine i completely agree with that um as a left wing person myself that seems you know entirely natural to me However, you know, this idea of rebalancing is kind of off balance in my, in my way of thinking. So if you're white, male and heterosexual, um, as Morrissey said about, you know, his dislike of sort of, sort of soul music and disco music and stuff. Many years ago, he, he wrote um, in that song, um, in, it's a Smith song, isn't it? Pam, Panic. Um, the music that they constantly play says nothing to me about my life. So if the other is allowed this subject subjectivity, then let Morrissey have his subjectivity as well. And yes, I know Morrissey is probably gay and that is pretty much reflected in what he said. But the point is this, he can come out and say that, but he'd probably get pilloried for being so because he's white and male. So there's a lack of equivalence there. There's a lack of a real social cont contract. So that's that's that out of the way. But moving on to Japan themselves, I hear you say at last. Um, Mark Fisher says this. Um, let's see. One of my earliest pop fixations has returned, vindicated in an unexpected context. Early 80s new romantic synth pop reviled and ridiculed in Britain, but revered in the dance music scenes of Detroit, New York and Chicago, was finally coming home to roost in the UK in the UK underground. Now, hang on a minute. 
New Romantic synth pop was really popular. It sold a huge amount of records. There were loads of hit singles, pretty more hit singles than there were albums. And the question is, is he including, you know, Japan within that? A lot of people would say, yes, they were New Romantic synth pop. But as I pointed out, they were precursors. They came before that. They came from the tradition of true glam and the Euromantics of Bowie and Roxy and what have you, the Velvet Underground. You can look at the cover versions and yeah, there was some soul in there because of course there were two Smoggy Robinson covers as well. Um, but the real point is that, you know, he suggests that um, the fact that they were loved in the underground um, in, um, you know, the dance music scenes of Detroit, New York and Chicago is a kind of validation. Well, the fact is Japan were underground until pretty much Ghosts came out. You know, a lot of their hit singles were reissues two, two years or more after the fact. You know, things like Quiet Life and Second and Emotion Charted, you know, a couple of years after when everybody had caught up with them. So Japan were underground. They were a reviled band. You know, they were the reviled ones. I think when you get to the actual new romantic synth pop period, it's a different story. So again, I think, you know, his work does make me wonder there. It says that nothing else that Japan recorded was like ghosts. It was an anomaly. Really? Um, not only because of its seeming confessionalism, and yet we're saying that there wasn't confessionalism on things like despair, um, the other side of life from 79. It, there were probably confessional things in the first two albums as well. It's just, you know, they are the ones that were looked down on because they were sort of rock records and what have you. They're great rock records. Um, so he goes and say, not only because of its seeming confessionalism, exceptional in the work of a group which favoured aesthetic poses over emotional expression. Again, let's question that. Are we saying that the tenant is unemotional, in a, it, that it's not emotional in the same way that, say, ghosts is? You know, I can see a real parallel. The tenant... Um, again, the other side of life, despair, any number of the tracks on Quiet Life and on Gentlemen Take Polaroids. There's that quiet melancholy, that solitude, that romanticism, you know, that despair. It's there throughout. It's not just there in Ghosts. So, you know, I, I don't really think that's very valid at all. And you think, did he actually listen to Japan? Was he a fan? He seems to have been a fan, but, you know, it doesn't really come through. So he goes on to say... Um, Exceptional the work of group which favoured aesthetic poses over emotional expression, but also because of its arrangements, its texture. OK, so it doesn't have a bass on it. It doesn't have it doesn't have drums on it. Um, he goes on about Japan um, on Tin Life saying had developed a plastic ethno funk where electronics flitted through the elasticated rhythmic architecture created by the bass and drums. On Ghost, however, there are no drums and no bass line. There is only percussion that sounds like metallic vertebrae being gently struck, the marimba, Steve Jansen, and a suite of sounds so austerely synthetic they could have come from Stockhausen. Well, yes, and why not? I mean, Barbieri and Sylvian had been crafting carefully with digital synths, avoiding the presets, spending a lot of time programming to get these new sounds. Only Eno was doing similar things, as I've said. So, um, you know, I don't, you know, OK, there isn't bass and drums, but... I mean, if you listen to the drums on Tinder, if you listen to Steve Jansen's drumming, as he listened to that bass, both, you know, stunningly original, timbrely, texturally. Nobody else is like Mick Khan. Loads of people copied him. Nobody else is like Steve Jansen. And of course, his type of playing sort of influenced people to pick up Simmons kits and things. So they sounded more like him. So they sounded more light and crisp. So, you know, I don't entirely think uh, Mark Fisher was, you know, really that accurate in his sort of discussion of Japan and his criti critique of them. So also then he talks about how tricky, um, you know, sampled um, part of Ghosts and what have you. And he talks about another artist um, who's right at the beginning of the chapter. Bear with me while I find it. He talks about... Um, um, Rufus Crow's Ghosts of My Life um, EP from 1994 and there's a sample there from it. He talks about um, the guy from the pop group Mark Stewart quoting the lyric in a song later on. Um, so you know it's all very well and good and yeah and I'm sure they all they all you know they're all good guys they all loved um, the song and what Japan had done. But you know if you're talking about modernism and postmodernism, let's look at it. Ghosts, Japan. Japan were modern. They were romantic. They were innovators. They did something new. 
Yes, you could see their precedents clearly, you could see their influences, but they did something new. Can we say the same about artists who rely on sampling? I'll leave you to think about that yourself. This is Outlaw Bookseller signing out. Thanks for indulging me and in listening to this. I'd love to see what your comments are about Japan, ghosts, hauntology, and Mark Fisher's writings. Bye for now.